Good evening, everyone. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Nathaniel Holt, author of Rise of the Rocket Girls, the woman who propelled us from missiles to the moon to Mars. Throughout her career, Dr. Holt has focused on telling serious science sto stories through the human lens, culminating in published works in the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, the Atlantic, Slate, Time, Popular Science, and her highly acclaimed first book, Cured, The People Who Defeated HIV. In Rise of the Rocket Girls, Dr. Holt examines a group of elite young women at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. They were brought together by their deep love of math and whose work influenced military rocket design, brought us the first American satellite, and shaped many lunar missions. School Library Journal had this to say about Rise of the Rocket Girls. We take so much for granted now, but in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, women who wanted a career other than homemaker were mostly limited to becoming teachers, nurses, or secretaries, and there was no such thing as maternity leave. However, a few smart young women who loved math were hired to be human computers for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. What we think of as computers now hadn't been invented yet. These women spent their days writing equations and computing numbers with pencils, paper, and sli uh, slide rules to give the male engineers the information they needed to build rockets, satellites, and space shuttles. Please help me welcome Dr. Nathalia Holt. Well, thank you so much for having me here. It is wonderful to see all of this programming in science and NASA. I know that all of these programs make a huge difference for young people, and I am honored to be part of this and excited to talk to you about the Rocket Girls tonight. Now, authors get their book ideas from all kinds of interesting places. I have known authors that have spent a year in the National Archives just pouring through documents looking for one little paper that can tingle an interest. And I've also known authors that have been fortunate enough to be handed their book subjects from editors. But for me, for this book, I came across this subject completely at random. And it started in 2010. My husband and I had just moved from California to Boston and I was pregnant. We were expecting our first child, and we could not agree on a baby name. We made these long lists of names, we fought over names, there was nothing that seemed right. And then my husband suggested the name Eleanor Francis. When I first heard this name, I wasn't sure, because this is an old-fashioned name. And so I did what parents do these days, and I Googled the name. And the first person to come up in my search was a woman named Eleanor Francis Helene. And my browser was suddenly filled with this picture of her. This is a picture of her accepting an award at NASA in the 1960s. And when I saw it, I was stunned. I had no idea that women worked at NASA at this time, much less as scientists. And this really struck me because I have a PhD in microbiology I consider myself well-versed in the contributions of female scientists, and yet I had never heard of women working at NASA. And so I knew I wanted to learn more. And what I found out was that Eleanor Francis wasn't alone. She was one of a large group of women who worked at NASA during this time, and even part of this really special group, this really key group that worked at a place called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL, nestled in the foothills of Pasadena. Now, JPL as a laboratory has a very fascinating history. It is a laboratory that's part of NASA today, but it was founded by a very unusual group of men, and they were named the Suicide Squad. Now, they received this name because of the very dangerous experiments they performed on the Caltech campus where some of them were students, and some of them were just young people who really liked to fire rockets. <laughs> so they sent up a flume of nitrogen dioxide that ruined landscaping. 
They then set off an explosion in the engineering building, which rusted a brand new and very expensive wind tunnel. And then finally, they set off another explosion that knocked off the side of a building, almost killing one of their own members. And it was at this point that the Caltech administrator said, okay, this is enough, you guys have to go. And this is where they went. They went to this abandoned area outside of town and started firing their rockets there. It's important to note that at this time, this is the early 1930s, rocket science is really considered a fringe science. It's not something that a serious scientist or engineer wants to be associated with. And in fact, for this group, their professors told them that what they were doing was impossible. You would never be able to get rockets into space. But they persisted. And in 1935, they received the US government's first grant into rocket research. And with that money, $1,000, a huge sum at the time, they were able to hire their first employees. And one of the first people they hired was a woman named Barbie Canwright. Now, Barbie was a friend of theirs. She was originally from Ohio, and she moved, eloped with her husband to Southern California, where she was working as a typist at Caltech. But she was also a student at a local junior college. And at that junior college, she took as much math and science as she possibly could. She loved those fields. But unfortunately, she had no idea where she could use her skills. Because at that time, the options for a woman to pursue a career in science were very limited. It's important to remember that at this point, medical schools, engineering schools are all close to women. But there was one job that was available for women that were skilled in math, and that job was called a computer. So before computers looked like this, they actually looked like this. <laughs> for most of human history, a computer meant simply a person who computes, and laboratories would hire large numbers of computers to perform the calculations for their experiments. Now this man here, Alexis Claude Clairaut, was one of the earliest known computers. He was a French astronomer and mathematician. And in the mid 18th century, he was hired to work as a computer to calculate the return of Halley's Comet. Now he didn't do this alone. He worked with another computer. Her name was Nicole Rain Lapote. And the two of them spent months doing all of these hand calculations to determine the return of Halley's Comet. But in 1950, or sorry, 1758, when it became time to announce their findings, it was only Clairaut's name on the papers. The female computer was left off. Her contributions were not acknowledged. And unfortunately, this is really just the beginning of female computers not receiving their due. Now, this is a group of computers that worked at the Harvard Observatory in the 1800s. They were hired by a man named Charles Edward Pickering, and they were responsible for analyzing the vast amount of data that was coming into the observatory. They made a star classification system and were mapping out the sky. Now, Pickering said that the reason he hired only women to be computers was because the female sex was better detail-oriented. But the real reason may be that they could be paid quite a bit less. They made about half of what a man would make, about 25 to 50 cents an hour. Now, the number of computers got a big boost in this country in 1935 as part of the Works Progress Administration when the US government hired 450 computers. 76 of them were women. And their supervisor was actually a woman, too. Her name was Dr. Gertrude Blanche, and she had a PhD in mathematics. And this group created something very special. They were working on something called the Mathematical Tables Project, which was this 28-volume set of logarithms, trigonometry, and exponential functions that would one day form an essential component of our first steps into space. And the first person to use these books at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was Barbie Canwright. She and her husband, Richard, were both hired as the lab's first computers. And this small group was working on something called the rocket plane, or JADO, Jet Assisted Takeoff. And the idea here is that they were strapping on their homemade rockets onto the side of these small, light, fixed-wing aircraft. 
And the idea was that they could someday adapt this technology to power bombers over the Pacific. As you can imagine, there were quite a few accidents in those early days. There were many things that did not go right. But the group persisted, and they ended up having some success and getting a second grant from the US government, which they were able to use to use this technology to power bombers. And so with this second grant, Richard Canwright was promoted to the position of engineer, but Barbie was not. She remained a computer, and that's really how it was. Women were computers and men were engineers. So with Richard promoted, the lab now needed to hire a few more computers. They hired two women and one man, and one of these women would have a very influential role in the future of the lab, and her name was Macy Roberts. And in 1941, she was made supervisor of the computing section. Now this was a very big deal at the time. There were no other women who were heads of section. It was a big responsibility for a growing group, and she had to do a lot of hiring. And she decided that even though she received applications from both men and women to join her as a computer, she was only going to hire women. Uh, obviously, you couldn't do this today. This would not work. But her thinking then was that she wanted to create a cohesive group. She really wanted it to feel like a family. And so for that reason, she hired a lot of women. They came from all over the country. She actually preferred to hire women from the East Coast because she believed that their education was better. And many of them did have advanced degrees. So the woman in the center is named Janez Lawson. She was the first African-American hired in a technical role at the lab. And she had a degree in chemical engineering from UCLA. So today, she would be hired as an engineer. Back then, she was hired as a computer. And these women worked with just paper and pencil, slide rules, and these very clunky machines called Frieden calculators that despite their size and noise could really do very little, just basic addition and subtraction. Later models could do square roots. And with just these tools, they were working on calculating the potential of early rocket propellants and the trajectories of early missiles. So they were looking at this missile, this kind of behemoth here is a corporal, it's 39 feet tall. They also worked on a smaller missile called the Sargent, this kind of smaller surface-to-surface -surface missile. But when I spoke to the woman today, what I learned was that even as they were calculating the potential of these rockets, their true love was space exploration. And we really see that in the 1950s when they began using their missile calculations for a project called Jupiter-C. And the goal of Jupiter-C was to launch the world's first satellite. And so to do this, they took their calculations for the Sargent missile, but they used a scaled-down version that the woman called baby sergeants. And so they took 12 of these baby sergeants, they strapped them together, they placed them in this big spinning tub that could balance out the thrust between all of these rockets. They then placed a second tub with five more baby sergeants, this was all placed on top of a large redstone rocket, and at its very peak was a single baby sergeant whose goal was to launch the satellite. Now on September 20th, 1956, they launched Jupiter-C. And the woman that I spoke to about that night still remember the excitement of the launch because that rocket broke all records for its day. It rose 3,335 miles into the air. It broke speed records. It was really incredible. But at its peak, there was no satellite. It was actually weighed down with sandbags. And the reason for that was because the Eisenhower administration had not given them a go-ahead to launch a satellite. And so you can imagine how frustrated the women were when a year later, in October 1957, the Soviet Union launches Sputnik. And when I talk to the women today, they are still angry. This is still a big source of frustration. And it actually wasn't until a second Sputnik was launched that the Eisenhower administration finally gave them the green light. And on January 31st, 1958, 
they all got ready to launch Explore One, America's first satellite. Now, there were actually many women that were in mission control for this mission, but none was more important than a woman named Barbara Paulson. She was responsible for calculating the trajectory of the satellite as it left Earth. And so to do this, she is sitting at a light table in mission control. She has her graph paper and pencils because this is all done by hand. And standing over her shoulder are Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, and Lee Dubridge, who was then president of Caltech. And everyone in the room is waiting on her calculations to find out if this satellite will be a success. And when she calculates that yes, Explorer One has made it, America has its first satellite, the room erupts in celebration. It is an incredible moment. It is also the birth of NASA. Everything changes after Explorer One. The women will never work on military weaponry again and instead are now focused on space. Things are changing for Barbara too. At this point, Macy Roberts is retiring, and Barbara, who has worked at the lab for a decade, is her natural replacement. But she's also 30 years old, about to get married, and a year after that, about to have her first child. And at this point of time, 1960, it was very unusual for mothers to work outside the home. So only about 25% of mothers in 1960 worked outside the home. But Barbara decides that she really loves her job and she's going to find a way to make this work. So you can imagine how shocked she is when at eight months pregnant, the lab's administrators learn that she's expecting and immediately fire her. They tell her she has to pack up her things and leave that day. And Barbara is just devastated. She believed that her work was so critical to the lab, and she goes home to her husband, Harry, and just cries, I thought I was worth more than that. Now, fortunately, Barbara is able to come back and have a 45-year career at NASA, and she's able to do so thanks to a woman named Helen Lang, who you can see standing up in the second row of this picture. Now, Helen Lang was born in China, she endured many atrocities during World War II. She came to the United States for college and then applied to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to work as a computer. Macy Roberts hired her in 1955, and immediately the lab realizes that Helen is special. She is a very gifted mathematician. And so she is made as Barbara's replacement when Barbara's fired. Helen, however, is also 30. She's also just gotten married and she's about to start a family. And so Helen realizes that she needs to learn from Barbara's mistakes and so she hides her pregnancy as long as she possibly can. And then when it's time to have the baby, she bundles up all of her sick and vacation time in order to be able to take some months off. This is all happening, of course, before maternity leave. So this is the only way that she can keep her job as supervisor of the group. And so Helen is able to do this, but she decides that it's not just enough for her to come back. She wants to bring other women back, and she wants to make this a place where mothers can work. And so she starts creating these very complex charts. It's hard to see here, I'm sorry. Um, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how hard she worked on this. She tracked everyone's comings and goings over the years, carefully making sure that when women wanted to come back to work after having a baby, their jobs would be held for them. And by doing this, the women really lean on each other and they create this culture of working motherhood that simply did not exist in the lab before them. Now this is all happening at a very interesting time in the history of technology. Because IBM computers, which have been used in industry for about a decade, are only just now gaining prominence at NASA. NASA was a little slower than other industries to adopt them. And what I found in my research was that at most NASA centers, once IBM computers came in, the women who worked as computers were fired. And there's many examples of this. I'm showing you two groups of computers here. On the bottom, the group of women with the snowman uh, were a group of women computers who worked at the Dryden Center, and as soon as digital computers came in, 
their section was completely dissolved and all of these women lost their jobs. The picture on the top is a group of women who you may be more familiar with. They were a group of computers who worked at Langley Research Center. And the stories of them, and particularly the African-American women who worked as computers, was told just so beautifully in the book and movie Hidden Figures. And sadly for that group of computers, by the late 1960s, that group was almost completely dissolved. It was just a few women who were able to go on and keep their jobs. This was not the case at JPL. Instead of being dissolved, the group was actually kept together, and they were given very early computer language training. So they were sent to Caltech for training in early languages, such as Fortran. And they worked on early IBMs such as this one. This is an IBM 1620 that the woman very affectionately named Cora. She became one of the group. <laughs> and it was this group of women at JPL who wrote the first programs that sent spacecraft to the moon and to the planets. And they did it on cards just like these. So I'm often asked, why is this? Why was the group at JPL preserved? Why were they able to have such long careers? And there's many reasons for this. Part of it is that JPL has this crazy history. It was founded by the Suicide Squad. And so because of that, because of its association with Caltech, it always had more of this collegial college campus feel whereas most of these other NASA centers were really military installations. Um, but despite all of the progressive thinking of this group in California, the women were, of course, still subject to gender norms of the day. And one of those that I found most surprising were the beauty contests. <laughs> I was shocked when I found these pictures of misguided missile. <laughs> later renamed the Queen of Outer Space. And it's, it's really surprising that for decades, NASA held these contests in California, and women from every department would participate in them. Um, and as, as hard as it is to believe that, that NASA did this, um, in some ways it does show the liberality of their hiring practices. No other NASA center could have held a beauty contest because they didn't hire enough women. Um, but my, my favorite beauty contest story happens in 1964 as part of the Ranger series of missions. Now, these missions were sending a camera to take the first close-up pictures of the lunar surface. And the idea here is that they were trying to pick the right landing spot for Apollo. But it turns out that getting to the moon was incredibly difficult. And at this point, 1964, there have already been five failed missions. And so there is a lot of pressure on JPL to get this one right. And so for this mission, the head of the lab, Bill Pickering, is at Washington, DC. And he's sitting on an open phone line with President Johnson. And they're listening to a live feed of Ranger as it's headed towards the lunar surface. So you can imagine what this moment is like. Everything is quiet, it's very tense. And then all of a sudden they hear a voice. Spray on Avon and walk in fragrant beauty. <laughs> Everyone kind of looks around at each other. Where is this coming from? Surely this is not coming from the moon. And then they realize that they have switched feeds with the ongoing queen of outer space contest in Pasadena. <laughs> Oh, it is just incredibly embarrassing. <laughs> but even worse is when they realize that Ranger 6 has also failed. And it's not until Ranger 7 that we get those first pictures of the Sea of Tranquility, which of course helps pave way for Apollo 11's landing there in 1969. And the women's fingerprints are really all over this mission, not just because of these early reconnaissance missions they were part of, but also the rockets, the propellant that uh, powered this mission was helped design by the women at JPL. And even those first words, one small step, was made possible because of the deep space network that these women labored to build. Something else monumental happened in 1969, and that is that the women finally became engineers. This is Helen Lang. She is still supervisor of the group. She was supervisor for many decades. 
And she decides that this is, it's, it's not enough that it's just them. And they, you know, this is a, a very meaningful moment for them because they have been looking for this, this type of recognition and of course the salary raise that accompanies it. But Helen decides that she also wants to grow their group. This is not so easy because at this point, 1969, most engineering schools are still closed to women. So Caltech, for example, didn't open its doors until 1970, and even then it only admitted three women. So to find female engineers to bring into their group is quite a challenge. Helen decides to get around this. She starts bringing in women who have undergraduate degrees in math. She trains them in the laboratory and then encourages them to go to night school for engineering, which is a, was a training program at a local junior college. And by doing this, Helen is able to fill the lab with female engineers who otherwise would never have gotten into the door. And these female engineers are really needed at this point because the women are working on a new mission called the Grand Tour. And this was, had been proposed for, for many years, but in 1970, they were making the plans for this mission. And the goal here was to send spacecraft all the way to the outer planets to Jupiter, to Saturn, to Uranus, to Neptune. This, of course, would be expensive. And by 1970, budget cuts were taking place at NASA. And so the Grand Tour was unfortunately canceled. Now, for the women at JPL, this was really unacceptable. And of course, for many of the male engineers, too, because this mission took advantage of a once in every 270 year alignment of the planets. So they knew that they had to save this mission. So one of the engineers that Helen hired, her name is Sylvia Miller, she came in one weekend uh, with two of her colleagues and they devised a trajectory that would save the mission. They did this using gravity assist. So they took the gravitational pull of the planets to work as a slingshot and send a spacecraft further and further into space by this technique. And in doing so, they were able to save the mission. And we now know it as Voyagers. 1977, they launched the Voyagers based on the trajectory made that weekend. And of course, this mission completely changed textbooks and gave us all of these beautiful images of our solar system today. The Voyagers are still going. Voyager 1 is the only human-made object to have ever left our solar system. And the women's careers continued. In the 1980s, they worked on Magellan, which was a return to Venus. They also worked on Galileo, a further exploration of Jupiter and its moons. By the 1990s, this group was still going strong, and they began using their computer programming skills to send rovers to Mars. Now, by the late 1990s, most of this group was at the point of retirement, finally. But in 2013, I was able to bring the surviving members of this group back to JPL. And this was such an incredible event. These are women that had not been back to this lab in, in many years. And so to be there together, to see it through their eyes was such a wonderful experience. And I think it probably brought back a lot of memories that might not have come so easily without it. But I was surprised to see how much the women had been forgotten by NASA. And in fact, I document several instances of this in the book. One of them is that in 2008, NASA held a big gala in honor of Explorer 1, America's first satellite. But they didn't invite any of the women who were part of that mission. Not even Barbara Paulson, who was such a key member of that mission's success. Um, the biggest disappointment for me, however, has been the treatment of Sue Finley. So Sue Finley was hired by Macy Roberts in 1958, before NASA was even created, and she still works there today. She is NASA's longest serving female employee. However, in 2004, NASA made a new administrative rule that if you do not hold an engineering degree, you cannot hold the title of engineer. And so even though her work remains the same, they downgraded her position to that of technician. And this has been a, a real source of contention for Sue. Of course, she's disappointed by it. 
but she loves her job and she has no plans of retirement. She is currently working on the Deep Space Network and just has been finishing up some work that she's done on Juno, which is our mission to Jupiter. So I wanted to tell this story because of women like Sue and because this group of women so deserve to have their histories known, but also hopefully be, to serve as an inspiration for other young people today. And we're seeing, particularly in computer science, a very dire situation for women. In 1984, 37% of bachelor degrees in computer science were awarded to women, and today that number has dropped to 18%. In addition, we see that about half of all women working in STEM fields leave mid-career. And we also see a very stagnating interest in STEM by female high school graduates. So the red line on top is showing interest in STEM by male high school graduates. And you can see that those numbers have remained fairly steady. They're hovering right about 45% today. But for women, the numbers really haven't changed much in two decades, and they're hovering right below 15%. The good news is, is that there are a lot of organizations working to change this. We have all of these great groups, such as Girls Who Code and Code Ed, that are really seeking to bring young women interested in computer science and interested in programming. And in addition, we're seeing a lot of colleges make changes to their curricula. So this is just one example. This is Harvey Mudd College in Southern California. And they noticed in 2005 that they had only about 15% of their graduates in computer science who were women. And so they decided to make some changes. And what they did was they changed the structure of the introductory computer science classes so that even students who had no previous background in computers could still get started in the major. They also made research opportunities available sooner. And they also started sending their female students to this Grace Hopper Conference in Computing. And by making these changes, we now see that about half of the bachelor degrees in computer science are being awarded to women. So we know that there are some, some very key changes that can make a difference in colleges. Another bright spot is the NASA class. 2016 marks the first year that half of the NASA class were women. And at JPL, there are more women employed at every level than any other NASA center. And that is directly thanks to Helen and Sue and Barbara and this amazing group of women that hired and mentored them. This is my daughter. <laughs> so we did name her Eleanor Francis and she is six years old. She is named in part for a woman who sadly I never had a chance to meet. Eleanor Francis Helene passed away a year before I started writing this book. But I hope that her stories and that of these other women will one day inspire her. So thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. If anyone has a question for Dr. Holt, please raise your hand. Yeah, I'm working on a book right now that looks at early female animators at Walt Disney Studios. Yeah, their experiences are quite different than the women at NASA, um, but very colorful. <laughs> yes? I just wanted to make a comment. Um, in addition to um, having the women get to see each other at the reunion, which I'm sure was great for them, by doing that, I feel that you made them feel important and recognized. And so if there's something great to be taken away from this book, that's what I would say. Oh, thank you so much. You know, it's been such a pleasure for me. I feel very lucky to have gotten to, to, met, to meet them and spend time with them. It actually wasn't very easy to find them. I, um, I didn't talk about that tonight, but 
most of their contact information was not at NASA. They had none of their phone numbers, and so to find them was actually quite difficult. But it's been such a pleasure. I, I still have very strong relationships with several of the women, and I feel very fortunate. Yes? Have you had any input from NASA itself? Any, any response to the book? Yes, they, they have endorsed the book. The director of JPL has given it some great praise. Um, and I've had some promises that the women will be included in future anniversaries and ceremonies, which you can, you can better believe I'll be following up on and making sure that happens. <laughs> yes? Yes, she did. So, yes, that's Barbara Paulson. She had a 45-year career at NASA. She plays such a key role in this book. I mean, she worked on really just about every mission you can think of. She didn't come back as supervisor, um, but quite frankly, Helen Ling was an astounding supervisor. She was a supervisor, as you can see, for decades after that. Um, and very much loved. They were a very tight group of friends, so there really wasn't, you know, I mean, of course, any coworkers, any friends will have some bad moments, um, but there, there wasn't really that anger and jealousy about that job title. Yes? Did you talk to any or many of the men or supervisors of these women at the time to kind of get their perspectives on either what happened at the time or what the perspectives of all time were? I did. Yeah, I did speak to many of the men they worked with. I, you know, I really wanted to make sure that, you know, because we're talking about memories that are in many cases decades old, it was very important to get it, as many other corresponding memories and, and data from the archives as well. And it was very interesting to talk to the men they worked with um, because there was more of a respect there than I think I, I expected there to be. Um, they, they really did prize working with these women, and there are several of them that did really try to bring their situations up. So there's one male engineer I talked to who told me in the 1960s he was putting the women on publications, and that was just unheard of at that time. That was really not done, and it made a very big difference to their later careers and their later advancement that they had those publications. But there are also many instances of, of men that did not always do such great things. So there's some of those in there too, of course. <laughs> yes? You present this slide about attrition, um, current attrition of women in technical fields. Did you know track attrition in that period? Does it look much different? Um, so I assume you mean 1960s period. Yes, um, so you know the, the difficulty of course is that there weren't degrees in computer science at that time, although maybe you're not talking so much about the degree as you are about women staying in the, in the field. Yes, I would, I would imagine that, I, I don't know what that data is, but it's a good question because I'm, I bet that data is out there and I, I would expect those attrition rates would be very high for that time. Yes? You know, there, there are many theories for why there have been such declining numbers in women graduating with degrees in computer science. There have been some theories um, postulated that it has to do with gaming culture and the rise of gaming culture in the 80s that um, many people feel excluded women during that time. And there's many other theories as well. So I, I don't think we can look at any one cause at it. Um, but I think what's really interesting is to see how colleges are changing it. And it's really remarkable how they've been able to get these numbers up. I think it is a, a great framework for, for colleges all over. Great. Well, oh, sorry. Just because of the women before us, that have given us the opportunity. I've worked in television for 30 years, and I became a satellite truck operator and one of the first women in the country to do it because of these women and all the good dancers. I was the only one at the time at the station I worked at, but pretty soon there was one, and then there were two, and then there was a woman photographer. And it's little by little, but every single person before us made all the difference to let us do it together. I so agree. 
Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Yes. What was the woman who's still working there? I yeah, Sue Finlay. Yeah, she's 89. Yeah. <laughs> They're not. She just, she really loves her work there. I mean, it, it's, you can tell. She, she told me at, when I first started talking to her in 2011, she told me that she was going to retire after um, the Jupiter mission, after Juno. Um, and I, she thought that for a little while, and then now she's like, hmm, maybe Mars 2020, I'll retire after that. So uh, it might be a while, yeah. <laughs> Yes. So, um, can you just tell us a little bit about, like, I saw hidden figures in this blown away. So, how was your timeline corresponding with that movie, and has it propelled your book? You know, it, I, I feel so fortunate for hidden figures because I really believe that the book and the movie, which are both just so brilliant, really bring more attention to women in NASA and women in science, and it really raises the level of all of these stories. Um, I've I have actually been in contact with Margalee Shetterly, who is the author of that book. Um, it's just kind of a sort of a funny coincidence that both of our books came out the same year. We just by coincidence started researching our stories the same year. We had no idea the other person was working on it. Um, and I just, yeah, I feel very fortunate to, to have my story out now, too. It's, it's a lucky thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it hasn't. But I, I think a, a documentary would be great. When you love, <laughs> so you know. <laughs> yes. I'm so sorry. I didn't catch that. Um, how How did you yourself get interested in science, and how has your um, background and your approach to this book influenced how you reach your daughter? Oh, yes. So I, I really always loved science. It was always a passion of mine. Uh, maybe it's because my dad is a jazz musician and I had to rebel in some way. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and I, I have always really loved NASA and space. So it was so much fun for me to do the research for this book. And of course, my field is not in astrobiology or astrophysics. And so um, I was lucky enough to be able to bring in many different experts who helped me with this book. Um, a planetary scientists and astrophysicists who went through the manuscript with me and, and made sure to reduce any errors in there. Um, and I, I think it, it, in some ways, really helped describe the science in the book, the fact that I'm not an expert in this field, because it, it really kind of made me look at these subjects with very curious eyes without feeling that I know everything. It really gave me the opportunity to ask silly questions and I think because of that, I, I really enjoy talking about these subjects with young people. Um, I love going to schools, and it's fun for me. I, I even do explain things to my daughter quite a bit. Hopefully, I don't turn her off to science. <laughs> we'll see. You never know. But whatever she chooses, that's fine. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I'm really excited to hear the demo. You can explain, but um, how did you decide I did, yes. Yeah. So I, I came into this subject while looking for a baby name of all the, the crazy things. And it, it really was just that search for a name, Googling the name Eleanor Francis, that led me to this group of women and kind of became an obsession that took over years of my life before I had any idea it would be a book at all. So, yeah, it's funny. You never really know, you know, how, how your life will go, what kind of circumstances turn things around. Well, this one took six years, so, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so are you still working in any way in your field of, of uh, speed art I actually, I left research a, a couple of years ago to pursue this book. Um, and I, I feel really fortunate. I really love being able to write about these histories. It's great. Yeah. Yes? What's your next topic? Oh, yeah, I actually just answered that question. But it's a, it's a, oh, no, that's okay. It's, um, it's, a, it's a book on early women animators at Walt Disney Studio. Yeah. 
<laughs> and I'm happy. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Is there any time condition of your husband? Is there? I'm sorry. Is there any time condition of your husband? Well, I, I did dedicate the book to him and to my daughter, so I think that's pretty good. Not bad, right? <laughs> he does deserve more credit than he gets, poor guy. <laughs> well, I'm happy to answer other questions and sign books over there, so thank you so much. So to that end, before you move, let me just take two seconds. One, to thank Dr. Holt, because that was really fantastic. Thank you for being our kickoff speaker series. We appreciate it. Uh, number two, I want to take a moment to thank Fox Foxborough Cable Access, who's here tonight recording this event. And you can all tell your friends who missed it that you were here, and they have to watch it on TV. So that's the way it's going to be. Exactly. I also want to take a moment, as Dr. Holt mentioned, uh, we have books for sale around the corner because uh, Jeff Kinney's shop, An Unlikely Story, was kind enough to come out here tonight and provide the opportunity for you to purchase hard copy or paperback books, which Dr. Holt will be happy to stick around for a little bit to sign. I'm just confirming that there now that I've said it out loud. Um, <laughs> so thank you to Unlikely Story for their um, being here tonight to make that possible. And thank you also to Tova's Catering and to the Bartending Service of New England who provided our um, pre-talk refreshments upstairs in the cafe area. But most importantly, again, thank you all to you for coming out tonight. Please stop by the Unlikely Story booth, buy one, six, 12 books for Dr. Holt, who will be happy if you buy 12 to sign all 12. There it is. Thank you again for coming out here tonight. Appreciate it.